Happy New Year and welcome back to the Walla Walla Garden City Gazette. Yes, we are now in the year 1895 and this issue is January 5th, 1895. Fort will remain. Mr. H. C. Gregg, special correspondent for the Spokesman Review, returned from Spokane Thursday evening. Referring to the Army Post question, Mr. Gregg said that he was informed by the citizens of Spokane, who are in a position to know, that Fort Walla Walla will not be abandoned. There is no doubt, however, but that Spokane will secure an infantry post which virtually means the concentration of Forts Spokane and Sherman at the new garrison. Fort Walla Walla is amply equipped to accommodate five companies of cavalry, and owing to its geographical location, it would seem inconsistent to abandon this post. With posts at Vancouver, Spokane, and Boise, the most available point for a garrison is Walla Walla, and as long as it is established at this point, there could be no good reason for abandoning it. It must be remembered that the Army is a necessity and not a luxury, and while congressmen have some pull in maneuvering the location of posts, the War Department is most likely to distribute the troops in garrisons where they are likely to be of use. Week's Happenings, as related by the Gazette's Graphophone. Short Talks About Things. Mr. G. E. Barnett is building a neat cottage on his farm five miles north of the city. Ursus Winchester is seriously ill at the residence of his parents on Grove Street. Mrs. F. M. Melton of 2nd Street entertained a few friends New Year's evening. The storm. The weather for the past three days has been decidedly winterish. Snow has been falling almost continuously for three days and nights, January 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. The beautiful is about eight inches deep, and the slain is becoming quite good. On the line of the ORNN Railroad, the snow is said to be from three to six feet deep in between the Dalles and Portland. In places, the snow has drifted badly. As the consequence, trains and mails are greatly delayed. At Rowena, a station 10 miles west of the Dalles, the train encountered such heavy snow drifts that it was necessary to divide it into sections in order to get it through. The present snowstorm is general throughout the Northwest extending into Northern California, where the snow is reported to be four feet deep. The heaviest snowfall in the Willamette Valley was at Portland, where its depth is 15 inches. This marks the longest stretch of snowing at one time since the county roads were built. The roads were never in better condition to receive the snow, and sleighing will have reached its highest standard of excellence. Nothing could have been better planned than this snowfall for the protection of the growing grain. The force of the Gazette office were treated to a box of choice cigars the day after New Year's by Mr. Jacob Lutcher, the popular tobacco and confectionery dealer. The recipients return thanks to Mr. Lutcher and hope that the year of 95 will have a happier ending for his family than the year just passed. Mr. and Mrs. Lutcher have the sympathy of the entire community in their sad bereavement in the loss of their little girl last week. Mr. Francis Garrick is reported out of danger. He has had a severe attack of typhoid fever, and his many friends have been apprehensive of the result of his sickness. 
but his political opponents have had no fear of his demise, as they say that a man of his age who could come out on top in the kind of election year like 94 couldn't be killed by anything less than genuine yellow fever. The Gazette is the best weekly paper published at the county seat of Walla Walla County. During 1894, it scooped the dailies on the most important local news events. This is the day of specialists. The Gazette makes a specialty of the news of Walla Walla and southeastern Washington. It is the only weekly in the state for one dollar a year. An Indian chief who is worth half a million special dispatch to the Cincinnati Inquirer. At Fishhook Bend, a place on the Snake River in the state of Washington, resides one of the wealthiest Indians in America, Wolf, chief of the Palouse tribe of the Snake Indians. Wolf owns 260 acres of land and is calculated to be worth nearly, if not quite, half a million dollars. His land is all under cultivation and he has upon it good buildings, house and barn, the house well furnished and the barns well stocked. Wolf has made his money principally in raising horses. Although he has a placer gold mine on his place, which he had worked to a considerable extent, and which has panned out considerable pay dirt. He has at the present time nearly 3,000 head of horses and has shipped within the past five years fully 6,000 head to market. Wolf is 50 years of age but does not look over 30 and has a most magnificent physique, which his pale-faced neighbors all envy. His Royal Highness is a great dandy. He dresses both in Indian and civilized costume, but prefers the Indian style. He generally wears a red woolen blanket thrown carelessly but artistically over one shoulder to allow the display of a gaudy calico or white shirt, but very low in the neck to allow the display in turn of a necklace made up of many colored beads, bear's teeth, bright colored shells, and beans. His fingers are generally covered with costly rings, while on his third finger he wears a magnificent seal. Elaborately beaded moccasins cover his feet, while his hair is banged a la Modoc and combed pompadour. His long black hair is braided in many strands with bright colored ribbons and silk cords. He wears a plug hat on state occasions, but generally goes bareheaded and with his braided scalp locks struck full of wild turkey and grouse feathers. Other times he wears the rim of an old derby hat decorated round about with coyote tails. Upon his wrists he always wears a large number of bracelets made of brass wire. Wolf likes to do things up in style and has therefore a fine stable of carriage horses and when he drives into Pasco, he does so with a coachman on the box of a genuine Brewster Baroque. He always puts up his horses at a livery stable and is very careful to specify that they shall be fed with the best hay. The old chief is a public-spirited citizen and becoming tired of ferrying across the Snake River when he wanted to drive to Walla Walla, he has, it is said, erected a fine wire suspension bridge at his own expense. He now drives over the bridge into the city of Walla Walla in his own carriages. Wolf was formerly a great horseback rider, but lately he has taken to riding in a carriage altogether. In spite of the fact that he has a comfortable house, well furnished, he has his teepee in the yard and sleeps wherein, no matter how inclement the weather. Girls Daring Feet There are not many girls who would dare leap from a yacht under sail in mid-ocean or, what was practically the same, to Rocking Bell Buoy, anchored five miles from shore. 
but this was the daring feat performed by Miss Laura Warwick, a maiden not yet 29 years old and a pretty girl. She is not a very large girl, but she is spirit. And when, in a tone of banter, William Westcott, a member of the Corinthian fleet of Atlantic, with whom she was out sailing, dared her, she mounted the prow of the boat, and as it went gliding by the big buoy, which was moving in unison with the rise and fall of the sea, she leapt upon the moving platform. It was a daring act. While she clung to the buoy, rocking like a cradle, her companion put away, and when at a sufficient distance, he produced his camera and snapped it. The photograph has only had a limited circulation among her immediate friends, but wherever it was shown, it called forth but a single exclamation. How did she dare do it? The bell buoy is anchored at the mouth of the inlet five miles from land. <laughs>